Good morning. This is Neil Paulimus. I want to welcome you to this month's seminar. The topic is fitting regression models containing categorical factors. Now, stat graphics, like many statistical packages, has a lot of facilities for doing regression, and it's definitely one of the more heavily used uh, sections of the program. Today I'm going to be talking about regression models that contain not only quantitative predictors, which is what we uh, typically get introduced to when we talk about regression, but also categorical factors, uh, factors that can only take discrete values. Now before I get going, I just want to give you a short uh, story about why I decided to cover this uh, topic today. Stack Graphics is located in a section of Virginia called the Virginia Piedmont. And it's about an hour west of Washington, D.C., but far enough away that uh, there's a lot of open space, and you can see here uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains in the distance. Well, about three weeks ago, uh, my wife and I went to a talk that was being given at the local volunteer fire company. Uh, by someone from the Piedmont Environmental Council. And she was concerned about what was happening to the populations of wild birds uh, in the Piedmont. It turns out that the population of wild birds has been going down significantly over recent years. And um, as part of her talk, um, she presented some regression models. Uh, regression models that showed that there were various factors affecting the population of wild birds, uh, including the type of grass that the landowners uh, grew in their fields when they weren't being used to, uh, to raise cattle and, and horses and so forth, of which there are a lot uh, in this part of Virginia. <clears throat> she didn't really dwell on it because it was mostly farmers and ranchers and so forth in the audience. But um, I could see from the screens uh, R squareds and p values and regression models and so forth. And I thought, wow, if, if regression is, has this sort of an application, then, then many, many people can obviously make good use of it. Um, as I said, uh, it turns out that the type of grass you sow, and I didn't know this, but there are two types of grasses, cool season grass and warm season grass. Uh, does have a significant effect on the wild bird population. Uh, it turns out that the warm season grasses, which are native to this area of Virginia, are much uh, more amenable uh, for the birds. And they don't pack down as, as much when the snow comes, so there's a lot more room for insects and birds and so forth to live. Well, type of grass was obviously a categorical factor uh, that she entered into her regression analysis. Now, we're not going to look at her data because she's in the process of doing a dissertation at George Mason University. And obviously, I, you know, she spent a long time collecting that data. But I have some other data just as interesting to illustrate how we handle categorical factors in uh, regression models. <clears throat> now, oops. I went one screen too far. An outline for today, we're going to start by talking about linear regression models that involve a single categorical predictor. Um, we'll then move on to linear models with multiple predictors. So we'll do a simple regression, then a multiple regression. And we'll finish out with several examples of other types of regression models. I have a, an example of a logistic regression, a nonlinear regression, and also one involving life data. Okay, now, since I couldn't use the uh, data on birds, uh, I didn't want to because she and a lot of colleagues have spent many, many mornings walking the fields in Virginia counting birds. Uh, I looked around on the internet to find a data set that I thought would be interesting. And it turns out that the Journal of Statistical Education has a data archive where there are a number of, of interesting data sets that folks have contributed. The data set I'm going to look at first today is one that has to do with diamonds. 
It was contributed by a fellow at the National University of Singapore. The data actually have information on 308 diamonds. And what we're going to be doing is building a regression model to predict the price of a diamond. Now you can see in this particular data file that there are a number of potential predictors of the price of a diamond. Uh, the most significant predictor, I think you can guess ahead of time, is going to be the carat weight. And we will be fitting a regression of price on carat weight. That's a quantitative variable. There are also, though, three categorical variables uh, that could affect the price. Uh, we know the color of each of the diamonds. We know the clarity. And we also know the certification body uh, that came up with the price. So what we want to do is we want to build a regression model, basically price against carat weight, but we also want to enhance it by putting in some of these categorical factors. Okay, now the model I'm going to start with, I find it uh, a good idea always to start with a, a simple model, will be one in which the dependent variable will be price and the primary independent variable will be carat weight. Together with carat weight, though, I want to introduce color as a categorical factor. Color, it turns out, in this data set has six levels. Uh, diamonds are rated as having colors D, E, F, G, H, and I, where D is the purest, the most uh, wanted diamond and the higher the letter, the, the less quality the diamond. So what we want to do is we want to fit a model now, a pricing model for the diamonds involving both carat weight, that's our quantitative variable, and uh, color, that's our categorical factor. Now, um, I'm a big believer, of course, in starting uh, whenever we have a, a new set of data by doing some simple plots. So I'm going to switch over here to stat graphics and you can see I have the data on the 308 diamonds uh, loaded into my data sheet. I'm going to start by going to the plot menu to scatter plots XY plot. We're going to put price on the Y axis, carat weight on the X axis, and it's going to show us that there is in fact quite a significant strong relationship between price and carat weight. As you might expect, uh, the bigger the diamond, the oh, more you're going to have to pay for it. On the other hand, you can see several other interesting features in this particular plot. You see that the relationship between price and carat weight is clearly not linear. You can see a well-defined curve uh, in that particular relationship. You can also see something we call heteroscedasticity. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that as the carat weight increases and the price increases, the variability around whatever relationship there is also increases. So if we're going to do some simple regression, we're going to have to find a way to handle and take care of both of those features in this data, both the nonlinearity between price and carat weight and also the heteroscedasticity. Now, there's a very nice procedure in stat graphics that you can use if you believe that some transformations of the variables might be necessary. And that is typically uh, the best approach particularly when you have heteroscedasticity present. Uh, to find a good transformation of the data, I'm going to go to the top menu to statlets and pick our curve fitting statlet. Uh, the Y variable will be price, the X variable will be carat weight, and when I press OK, it'll open up a statlet window where by default it will fit a simple regression, a simple linear regression. And you can see here that it's fit a, a straight line. The equation of the line is at the top 
its price equals a constant plus a slope times the carat weight. Well, that's the best fitting linear regression, not a very good model for the data, but obviously a place to start. Now, in order to find a better model, uh, our curve fitting statlet has several buttons on the toolbar. You see up at the top here a button that says optimize X, one that says optimize Y, and one that says optimize X and Y. I'm going to push optimize X and Y. And what it did when I pushed that button is it then applied the box Cox procedure to find a good transformation of both Y and X, which would give the best fit to this particular data. And you can see at the top that the model it came up with is log of price equal a constant plus a slope times carat weight raised to the 0 0.29 power. And I was actually very pleased when I, I saw that happen for the first time as I was preparing the webinar. Uh, the fact that uh, price came as <clears throat> the best transformation for price is a log is not at all surprising. It basically says that the percentage change uh, in price is related uh, to the weight rather than the absolute price. We find lots of pricing models uh, in which uh, taking the log is appropriate. As far as the X factor is concerned, it said the best power transformation was to take carat weight and raise it to the 0.29 power. Well, 0.29 is very, very close to 0.33. So it's very, very close to being the cube root of carat weight. And in fact, that's the price uh, of the model I'm going to, to work with the rest of this morning. I'm going to be looking at the log of price as a function of the cube root of the carat weight. Now, just so you can see what that transformation does, let me go back to the XY plot and transform the data. Let me go back here, uh, take the log of the data, okay, and take the carat weight raised to the 0 0.33 power. Okay, push OK, and you can see that in fact it does a very good job of linearizing the relationship and also of stabilizing the variance. You can see the variability is much more constant. Okay, now the one thing I haven't added in here yet is color. So let me push the right mouse button, go to pane options, and ask for point codes based on color. Okay. Now you can see of these 308 diamonds, uh, their colors D, E, F, G, H, and I. And you can, I think, just by looking at this, notice that color D tends to be at the top. Uh, they're the black points. Color I tends to be at the bottom of the line. Uh, they're the least attractive diamonds. So in fact, there is a significant relationship. What, what appears to be a significant relationship. We don't know if it's statistically significant yet. But it does look like color may affect the price. Okay, well, <clears throat> so much for looking at the data. Let's go ahead and build some statistical models. So let me go back to my PowerPoint slide and talk about the statistical models that I want to build for this particular data. Okay, by the way, I, I didn't remind you, but at the end of the webinar, I will be answering questions. And you can use the facility here of GoToWebinar to send questions uh, anytime during the webinar. I won't answer them, though, till, uh, till the end. Anyway, back to the model. We're going to now build a statistical model to estimate the price of diamonds. And based upon what we've seen so far, the dependent variable in our model is going to be the log of price. The primary independent variable is going to be carat weight raised to the 0.33 power, basically the cube root of carat weight. 
to handle color, we're going to construct indicator variables. Now, those of you who, who've taken a course in regression will, will be very familiar with this. In order to handle, for example, six levels of color, D, E, F, G, H, and I, you construct five indicator variables, some people call them dummy variables, that you can then enter into the model. Now, the way we're going to define the indicator variables initially here, the first indicator variable, I1, will be 1 if a diamond is color E and 0 if it's any other color. I2 will be 1 if it's color F and 0 otherwise. I3, I4, and I5 also will be 1 for particular colors. The mathematical model we're going to fit will be beta 0 plus beta 1 I1 plus beta 2 I2 and so forth. We'll have a term involving carat weight and we'll also have interactions between those indicators and the carat weight. Now, what is that going to do for us? Well, basically what that does is it ends up giving us six regression models, one for each color. Color D, for example, its model will be beta 0 plus beta 6x. All of the i's for color D are 0, so they all drop out. For color E, we get y equals beta 0 plus beta 1. So the intercept now becomes beta 0 plus beta 1 for color E, and the slope becomes beta 6 plus beta 7. Okay, so for each color, we have a term in the model that will differentiate the intercepts and other terms that will make the slopes different for each of the colors. Okay, so that's the mathematical model I want to fit. Now, where do I do this in stat graphics? Well, there's a procedure that we put in quite a few years ago that's just absolutely ideal for this. It's under the Relate menu, one factor, and it's called Comparison of Regression Lines. This particular procedure is designed for the case when you have one quantitative x and one categorical factor. Okay, now the way it runs, you put in your dependent variable, and for me, the dependent variable, the y variable, will be the log of price. The independent variable will be carat weight raised to the 0 0.33 power. That is the cube root of carat weight. Okay. Where it says level codes, I'll put in color. Okay. When I then press OK, it'll give me an option to assume equal intercepts or equal slopes. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm just going to let it go ahead and fit separate regression lines for each one of the colors. And you can see here, in fact, that there is a regression line, six regression lines, one for color D, one for color E, one for color F, G, H, and I. And they line up just about as you would expect them to line up with the line for color I near the bottom, the line for color D near the top. Now at the moment, of course, they all have different intercepts and they all have different slopes. In some cases, we can simplify the model. Uh, and one of the ways to simplify the model would be to assume that they all had the same slope. Okay, now, in order to figure out whether that would be a good thing to do, I'm going to come over here and look at what's called the further analysis of variance. The further analysis of variance has three lines in it. It has a line for the cube root of carat weight. It has a line for intercepts and a line for slopes. Small p-values are going to indicate significance. So there's a small p-value for carat weight it clearly has a significant impact on price. There's also, though, 
a small p-value for the intercepts and a small p-value for the slopes. The small p-value for the intercepts is basically a test of whether or not the intercepts for each of those six lines uh, might be the same. The fact that it's small indicates, no, there are significant differences, yes, there are, between the intercepts. We also have a small p-value for the slopes, which indicates also that there are significant differences between the slopes. So in fact, I can't simplify the model. If I could, I'd press the right mouse button, go to analysis options, and for example, say, assume equal slopes in which case it'll fit parallel regression lines. But in this case, um, that's not true, so I'm going to have to have separate uh, slopes for each. Now, by the way, if you want to see the fitted regression, you can look over here at the analysis options, and you can see in a table here that there are coefficients, a constant term, a coefficient on carat weight, coefficients on each of the five indicator variables, and also terms involving the cube root of carat weight times the indicator variables. If you really want to see the model, down at the bottom, the Stat Advisor has written out the complete mathematical model for you to look at. Okay, well that's the simplest uh, case. We have one X and one categorical factor. What do we do if we have more than one categorical factor? Well, we need, uh, in order to talk about that, to go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, here were my slides. And incidentally, I've posted these slides on our website and I'll give you the link uh, at the end of the talk. Now, if I have multiple predictors, and I do in this case, I have color, but I also have a categorical factor, clarity. And I have a third categorical factor, in fact, certification body. Uh, <clears throat> we can't use that simple procedure we used uh, just a moment ago when we had only one categorical factor. We do, though, have two choices. We can go and use the multiple regression procedure, or we can go and use the general linear models, the GLM procedure. Now, the disadvantage of using multiple regression is we would have to type in a line for every indicator variable that we wanted to put in our model. And there could be quite a few, particularly if we want to have interactions and all that sort of thing. On the other hand, the general linear models procedure automatically generates all the indicator variables that we need. We just need to tell it what columns have categorical factors and it will set up the indicators. Now, one thing that you do need to know is that the indicator variables are set up differently in the general linear models procedure than we just set them up a moment ago for the simple regression. Okay. The general linear models procedure uses the method that's used in the design of experiments, wizard. And I'll show you what the difference is here in how the indicator variables are set up. The way we just set up the indicator variables uh, and I think I went one screen too far. There we go. The way we set up the codes for the indicator variables when we just ran the comparison of regression lines is we defined five indicator variables. Each variable took the value one for a particular color and zero for all the other colors. Okay. In the general linear models procedure and also in our design of experiments section, we define the indicator variables differently. Now there will still be five indicator variables, but the first indicator variable will look like it does here in column I1. I1 in the general linear models procedure will be one if a diamond is colored D, 
it'll be zero if it's color E, F, G, or H, and it'll be a minus one if the diamond is color I. Likewise, I2 will be one if it's color E, minus one if it's color I, and zero otherwise. Now, why do we do that sort of coding? Well, the reason we do that coding is so that the average value of each of the indicator variables is zero. Now, there are major advantages to that because if I want to, for example, make predictions and I want to average over all the colors, I can simply set all the indicator variables to zero. If I set all the indicator variables to zero in my model, then I essentially am going to be making predictions for an average color. Well, I don't, not, it's not an average color. Averaged over the six colors is the way I should say that. Now, the next screen I've act also shows the implications with respect to the intercepts and the slopes of the model. You'll remember from a screen that I showed you a few moments ago that with the comparison of regression lines coding, the intercept for D was beta naught, for E was beta naught plus beta one, for F beta naught plus beta two, and so forth. So basically, B zero corresponded to color D, and the other betas showed how different those colors were, their intercepts from the intercept of D. Likewise, with the slope, you had beta six for color D and other betas to allow the slopes of the other colors to be different than D. With the coding we're going to be doing now, this is what the intercepts down at the bottom of this screen look like for the different colors. The intercept for color D is now beta naught plus beta one, and you can see what the different intercepts are. The interesting thing is if you add these up and divide by six, you get just beta naught. So the average of the intercepts is beta naught, and over here the average of the intercepts is beta six. It, there are major advantages of doing it that way when you have multiple categorical factors. Because as I said, when you're looking at graphs and predictions and so forth, and you want to average over the categories, you simply turn off all of the indicator variables. Okay, well let's go ahead and do this. Let's go back to stack graphics and go to the general linear models procedure and fit a model. So let's go to relate multiple factors, general linear models. Now the dependent variable that we'll be fitting will be the log of price. Okay, as it was before. There's a field here for categorical factors and a field for quantitative factors. The quantitative factors will be carat weight, well there will be just one, carat weight raised to the 0 0.33 power. Oops, I didn't type that quite right. Raised to the 0 0.33 power, that's better. I'm going to put in where it says categorical factors, all three of my categorical factors. I'm going to put in color, clarity, and the certification body. Okay. And as I said, the general linear models procedure is going to automatically set up its indicator variables for those categorical factors. Now, on the next screen, I need to specify the model that I want to fit. And it started by putting in a letter for each of my four factors corresponding to the main effects of the factors. I'm going to add into my model two-factor interactions by typing A star B, A star C, A star D, B 
B star C, B star D, and C star D. Those would be, correspond to interactions between pairs of factors. And an interaction in this case would mean that the effect of one of my factors could depend upon the level of another. Mm -hmm. I'll then press OK and OK again. Okay. And it's now gone and fit a multiple regression model involving both the ca uh, quantitative factor ca uh, carat weight and the three categorical factors. And if you look right in here, you can see p-values associated with each of the factors and each of the interactions. Now it turns out that there are in fact certain um, terms that are not statistically significant. Look at this p-value right here, 0.6156. That's clarity times certification body. Okay. It would be a good idea, typically good practice, at least this is the way I build models, if you see interactions like that that are not statistically significant, to take them out. Now the way you would take out clarity times certification body is you'd go back to the data and you'd take out the term involving clarity and certification body, which is B times C. I'd simply remove that and refit. Okay. Now that disappeared, but I see there's another one that's not statistically significant. That's color times clarification body. So let's go back and take that one out. Color times uh, certification body is a C. So let's get rid of that one. What I'm doing is essentially what's called a backward stepwise fit. I started with a complicated model and I'm now making it a little simpler. There's one more p-value above 0.05. It's color times uh, carat weight. One more term to take out and that's A star D. Let's remove that. And now we're down to a model that has all statistically significant terms in it. Okay. Now, if you're interested in seeing the model, um, I believe I can ask for model coefficients, okay, and it will show me what the, I believe it, it may show me the model or it may not. It may be too complicated. I guess it's too complicated to try to write it out. However, we do have a mathematical model. Now, why did we make a mathematical model? We made a mathematical model because we wanted to be able to predict the price of diamonds. Now, if you're not too familiar with stat graphics, I need to show you how we use this mathematical model to make predictions. If you want to make a prediction for a diamond that's not in the data set, you can come back to the data scroll down to the bottom and find an empty row. There we go. There were 308 diamonds in this particular data set. I'm now going to enter information about an imaginary diamond. Okay, this diamond is going to be 0.75 carat weight. I'm going to make it color E. It'll have very, very slight inclusions and we'll let the HRD certification body uh, examine it. I'm going, however, to leave the price. That's the dependent variable blank. And this is how you make predictions at using the fitted model. I'll click back on the general linear models procedure. I'll then click on reports and you can see in the report pane that it has predicted the log of price for that diamond to be 8.85939. Now that is a law uh, prediction for the log of price. 
And you can see, in addition, there are 95% confidence intervals uh, for the forecast and also for the mean price of those kinds of diamonds. Now, if I want to make it real dollars, I can take that particular field, hit Control-C to copy that to the clipboard, go up to the main toolbar and stack graphics and push my little calculator button. And then if I type in EXP, open parens, paste in that value, close parens, and push enter, you see the inverse transformation of the prediction. So we predict for that particular diamond a price of 7,040 Singapore dollars. Okay, the uh, prices of this particular data were in Singapore dollars, 7,040. Okay, so there you see a um, uh, example of using the model for prediction. Now, there's one other thing that I also need to show you. One of the big advantages of using the indicator codings that I defined for you is that we can then show you a plot of what are called the least squares means. The least squares means are the means, in this case for each color diamond, evaluated at the average of all the other factors. What you're seeing here is a plot of the log price, the mean log price, well, the mean plus an LSD interval for diamonds of each color. Diamonds of an average weight, an average clarity, and averaged over the three certification bodies. And it's very easy the way we coded the indicator variables to get those least squares means. We just turn off all the other indicator variables. So all the indicators for clarity and certification body are turned off and we just turn on a particular color. Now the fact that there are, is no overlap between uh, and any pair of colors here indicates that all the colors are significantly different. If I show you certification body instead, you also see that there are significant differences between the three certification bodies. HRD tends to value things a little higher than GIA, which values things even higher than IGI. So one of the big advantages of using the coding, uh, the DOE type coding, is that you get to see these nice LSD intervals on the least squares means. Okay, well, that's all I really want to say about the diamonds. Now I'd like to go and talk a little bit about other types of regressions that you can do, other types of regression models. And the next example is going to be a logistic regression. Now a logistic regression is used when your dependent variable is binary. Uh, it can take one of two different values. And I found an interesting data set also at the data archive of the Journal of Statistical Education on how well Barry Bonds did every time he came to bat in, I think it was the year 2001. Now, if you're not familiar with American baseball, Barry Bonds uh, was a uh, superstar uh, back uh, in the early, uh, around 2001, 2002, um, and holds many, many uh, major league records. Uh, unfortunately, his reputation was tarnished quite a bit uh, when they started investigating the use of steroids and so forth. So. He's actually not uh, currently in the Hall of Fame uh, because of that. Uh, he was, though, a, a superstar and was definitely quite good at getting on base. 
He played, incidentally, for the San Francisco Giants, and you can see a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, behind him. What I'm going to do is, is look at uh, how Barry Bonds did in the year 2001 and see if I can come up with a mathematical equation to predict how well he'd do when he came to bat. Now, I'm also going to uh, put these data sets up on our website so you all can play with them yourself uh, after the webinar. Uh, this particular data file is called, as you might guess, Barry Bonds. Uh, it consists of 648 rows. During the year 2001, uh, Bonds came to bat a total of 6, uh, 648 times. In the data file, we know a lot about what happened and what was going on every time he came to bat. We know the game number. We know what at bat it was in, within the game. So, for example, in game number one, he came to bat five times. There's an indicator variable identifying whether or not it's a home game. Home game, that would be a game in San Francisco, will have a 1, and if it was played anywhere else, it has a 0. We also have a set of indicator variables for whether there was a runner on first when Barry came to bat, whether there was a runner on second, and whether there was a runner on third. Okay. We also know how many outs there were when he came to bat. If you're not familiar with American baseball, you get three outs in each of nine innings. And you can see there's also a column for uh, the innings. We know how many runs were scored in that inning after and including when Barry came to bat. We have an indicator for whether he was walked. Sometimes if you have a, a, a good batter, well, first off, in baseball, uh, when you come to bat, you are, you, every pitch from the pitcher is either a ball or a strike. If there are three strikes, you're out. On the other hand, if you batter throws you four balls, you get to walk uh, to first base. Well, we know uh, which at-bats resulted in walks. We also know which were intentional walks. An intentional walk is when the pitcher doesn't try to get you out. Okay, uh, and Barry got quite a few intentional walks. Uh, they'll often uh, walk Barry hoping to pitch uh, and have better results with the batter that comes afterward. Okay. So those are, are all characteristics of what were going on. A lot of categorical factors there. The column that we're particularly interested in predicting is the column here called result. Result shows whether he was out or whether he got a single, double, triple, home run, and so forth. It actually has a code. Code zero means he was out, never got to base. One would mean he got the first base with a single. Two means he got the second base with a double. Uh, three for a triple, four for a home run, and five if he walked. Okay, what I'm going to try to do is set up a model to predict whether or not he got on base. And if result is greater than zero, it means he got on base. We also have a few quantitative factors. We have ERA, that's the earned run average of the opposing pitcher. Um, suffice it to say that the lower the ERA, the better the pitcher's been doing. And then we know what the score was uh, for the Giants and the opposing team every time Barry came to bat. Okay. Now, I'm going to set up a logistic regression. I'm going to let my Y variable be 1 if Bonds reached base and 0 otherwise. So it's a binary response. As predictors, we'll use the ERA, runs already scored, opposing team score, inning, number of outs when he came to bat, 
where there were runners, whether it was a home game, and so forth. Okay, so it's going to be a regression with a bunch of quantitative factors and also quite a few categorical factors. Okay. Now, in order to do this, I need to go back to stack graphics and let's put away the data on diamonds and instead open up the data on Barry Bonds. Okay. Here's the data that I want to model. To fit a logistic regression, we will go to relate, attribute data, logistic regression. Now this is going to look a lot like the general linear models procedure in that there'll be a field for the dependent variable, which is going to be result greater than zero. I'm going to type in result greater than zero. That will be my response. The quantitative factors are going to be ERA, the giant score, the opposing team score, and also what inning it was. So I'll put in four quantitative factors. For categorical factors, I'll put in the outs on first, on second, on third, and also whether or not it was a home game. Now, like the general linear models procedure, the logistic regression will set up whatever indicator variables it needs. When I push OK, I'll see the analysis options dialog box. And now I have several choices. I can fit a model involving all of the variables, or I can have it do some sort of variable selection. And I think I mentioned before that I like to do backwards selection. So I'm going to put my uh, selection there, press OK, and then I get a list of tables and graphs. Um, and I'll just take the defaults. And up here you will see the results. It has decided to bring in only two variables. It says that the chance of Barry Bonds getting to base really depended upon only two things, at least according to the likelihood ratio test down here. You see the p-values are less than 0.05. There are two significant factors that can predict whether Barry Bonds gets to base or not. The first is what inning is it in the game? The estimate of the coefficient on inning is negative, which means that actually his chance of getting on base goes down as inning goes up. There's also an indicator variable for on second equals zero. If on second equals zero, that means there's nobody on second base. And it turns out, and this is not surprising to anyone here in the office, I know who knows something about baseball, um, if there's a runner on second base, that often means that the defense can't shift uh, as fully as they might uh, to prevent Bonds from getting a hit. It also means that they often intentionally walk uh, Barry uh, to get to the person behind him. Now, to actually see the effect, I can come over here and, using pain options, ask it to plot the probability of getting on base as a function of innings. This shows you, with confidence limits, that the probability that Barry Bonds got on base if he came up in the first inning was about 55%. But as it went, as the game went on, by the time it got to the ninth inning, uh, it was under 50%. And occasionally there are extra innings, so the, the model just keeps going. This incidentally is set at the average value, well no, I'm sorry, not at the average value, at particular values of all the other predictors. Now it, it did pick an average ERA average scores, 
but it also picked particular levels for outs on first, on second, on third, and whether or not it was a home game. The only thing you will remember, though, that matters in this model is whether or not there was a batter on second. And in fact, I can show you what the model looks like with respect to on second. Um, it turns out that there's a much higher probability that Barry gets on base uh, almost 60%. Uh, well, actually, let me push the right mouse button and push locate. That'll bring up some crosshair cursors so I can actually read the values. If there's no one on base, there's about a 48.5% chance, if there's no one on second, that Barry would get on base. If there is somebody on second, it's more like 66%. So it's fairly dramatic. There's a much larger chance that Barry gets on base if, in fact, there's a runner on second. Well, that's an example of a logistic regression. I'm going to also show you just briefly two other uh, examples of how we can use categorical factors in regressions. Um, the first of the last two examples will be that of fitting a nonlinear model. If you've listened to my webinars before, you know that I've talked a lot about a file called 93cars. 93cars is a data file containing information on 93 different makes and models of automobiles. I'm going to show you how I would fit a model relating miles per gallon in highway driving to the weight of the automobile, taking into account whether or not that car has manual transmission. And I will note at the outset that the relationship between Y and X is nonlinear. So we're going to have a nonlinear model involving Y, one quantitative factor and one categorical factor. Okay. Let's go back to stack graphics. Let's clear out the data sheet and open up the data file called 93 cars. I'm going to start by doing a quick, simple regression. Tell it to show me miles per gallon in highway driving versus the weight of the automobiles. Now, by default, it'll start by fitting a linear model, which is fine, but I want to compare alternative models as well. Okay. So here's a plot of my automobile data. You see miles per gallon in highway driving on the y-axis, weight on the x-axis. It's gone and forced a linear model through that data and you can see at the top of the screen what the equation of the linear model is. One of the things I asked it to do, though, was to compare alternative models. And here you see a table where it's fed about 25 different models to the data. The linear model down here has an R squared of about 65.7%. Up at the top of the list, we see a multiplicative model. That has an R squared of 69.55%. Well, if I go back to the plot, push the right mouse button, go to analysis options, and ask for multiplicative, you can see that, in fact, that curvilinear model does pick up the relationship a little bit better than the linear model. Now, a multiplicative model is characterized by this particular equation. For a multiplicative model, miles per gallon in highway dr driving is e to the power, a constant plus a slope times the log of x. 
It's actually linear, it turns out, in the log-log scale. But in terms of miles per gallon in highway driving, it's E to the A plus B log X, if you like. Okay. Now, we want to take this model, however, and also put in a categorical factor. I want to add into this model here a term for whether or not the car has manual transmission. To do that, I'll have to go to relate multiple factors, nonlinear regression. Now, nonlinear regression, the way it works is you give it first your dependent variable. And then you type in any equation that you'd like to fit to the data. I'm going to type in the following. I'm going to type in EXP, open parens, B0, that'll be my intercept, plus B1 times the log of weight. Okay? That's the multiplicative model right there. Now I'm going to add my categorical factor. I'm going to say plus B2 times manual whether or not it has manual transmission. If I push OK, it'll come up and it will ask me for initial values of B0, B1, and B2. Now I really should be intelligent and enter good values. Often I'm just lazy though and let it start with 0.1 for everything. Uh, what it's going to do, incidentally, it's running a nonlinear regression, so it's going to do a search. And in fact, I know for simple models, I can usually push OK a couple times, OK a couple times, and it will go ahead and, and do a good fit for me. Okay. In fact, here is the model it fit. Uh, actually, that's the model for manual equal 0.5. That's averaged across different models. Okay, I can uh, set different values. There it is. There's the model for manual transmission. Now, if you want to know what's statistically significant, you go over here and look at the parameters. You see there's a parameter B0, a parameter B1, a parameter B2. There is no p-value, however, because there's no exact test available in a nonlinear regression. To judge statistical significance, what you need to do is you need to look at the asymptotic 95% confidence interval. For example, here is the estimate of B1. Here is the confidence interval for B1. If the confidence interval does not bracket zero, then that term is statistically significant, significantly different from zero. And you can see, in fact, that B1, the upper and lower, do not bracket zero. However, for B2, take a look at that, you'll see that the confidence interval for B2 brackets zero. What that's indicating to me is that actually there is not a statistically significant difference between manual transmissions, for which manual equals one, or automatic transmissions. Okay. That, however, is the way that you introduce a categorical factor into a nonlinear regression. You simply go ahead and type, actually set up the indicator variable. Manual is an indicator variable. And then you go ahead and put in a term uh, multiplying the indicator. Okay. One last example, and then I'll end and take some questions. And the last example will have to do with life data regression. Uh, life data regression is widely used if you're looking at survival times for example, of cancer patients who were given different treatments, or you're looking at time to failure 
of items being produced uh, by a manufacturing process. We have a particular procedure in Stack Graphics that will do a life data regression for us. Now, the important thing about life data, well, there's, there's two aspects of life data that cause it to be somewhat different than other uh, types of data. The first off is that the distribution around the regression line of life data is usually not normal. We haven't talked about the assumptions of our regression models, but one of the assumptions is that the data are normally distributed around the regression line. In life data regression, that's typically not true. The distribution around the regression line often takes a different form. Secondly, when you have life data, you often have what are called censored observations. For example, if you're looking at the survival time of patients, cancer patients giving some particular treatment, whenever you look at the data, some of the patients may have passed away, but some will still be living. The survival times of the patients that are still living are said to be right censored. The survival time will actually be bigger than you observed because there's, they haven't died. Well, um, I looked around on the internet for a data set I would, thought would be interesting uh, for life data regression with a categorical factor. That was the hard part in terms of finding a data. But I did find a good example in the Medical Journal of Australia. It had to do with methadone dosage and the retention of patients in maintenance treatment. Uh, these, I assume, were heroin addicts uh, who were trying to uh, beat the addiction by going to various clinics and taking methadone instead. What they were interested in understanding was what affected how long the patients uh, stayed uh, at the clinic, at least stayed uh, and continued their, their treatment. The primary data of interest here is going to be days in clinic. Days in clinic is the response variable. It shows how many days uh, a particular patient has stayed at the clinic, stayed in treatment. Um, and you can see, for example, the first patient had been treated for 428 days, the second for 275 days, and so forth. Some of the data is censored. You see a column over here with a censoring indicator. It's zero if the patient is no longer in the clinic. It's one if the patient is still there. So for example, the first patient is no longer there. So we know that they stayed in treatment for 428 days. On the other hand, patient A is still at the clinic. He's been treated for 796 days, but he's still there, so his eventual retention time is going to be greater than that. Okay. Now, the, there are, in addition, uh, several predictors of days in clinic. The primary predictor they were interested in looking at was the dose. They wondered whether the dose of methadone that was being given had any effect on how long the patient stayed at the clinic. There are also, though, two categorical factors. There's clinic, and there were two. And this column is either a one or a two, depending upon what clinic they were at. And there's a categorical factor for whether or not this patient had spent time in prison. Uh, it's one if they did previously spend time in prison and a zero otherwise. Okay, I'd like to uh, fit a life data regression model now. So let's go over to Stat Graphics. Let's close this particular data file and open up a data set Oh, I think I have it on my list of recent data files called methadone. 
and here it is, it, there are five columns. Now, to start, let me just look at the days in the clinic. Let me go to describe distribution fitting, fitting sensor data. I always like to start simple, so I'm going to start without any predictors. I'm going to look simply at the days in the clinic and use censored for my censoring indicator. Okay. There are a host of different distributions that I could use. I'm going to ask it to start by fitting a normal distribution, but I'm also going to ask it to give me a comparison of alternative distributions. This is what the days in the clinic looked like. And warning, some of these values are censored, so they will eventually turn out to be larger. And it's taken that censoring, incidentally, into account. It's done a maximum likelihood estimate accounting for the right censoring of the data. Okay. The data, though, are not particularly well modeled by a normal distribution. If I look at the pane over here, which gives me a comparison of alternative distributions, it looks like the best fitting distribution is actually a Yable distribution. Well, let me go back here and put a Yable on top of the normal for you. There's the Yable distribution. The Yable distribution starts at zero, comes up quickly, and has quite a long tail. And as I said, one of the things about survival times is rarely does a normal distribution do a good job for you. Okay. Well, that's just a picture. That doesn't take into account my predictors. That's not a regression. To do my regression, I need to go to relate life data. Now, there are two procedures for doing life data regression. One is parametric models and one is a non-parametric approach called Cox proportional hazards. I'm going to take the parametric approach. The dependent variable is going to be days in clinic. I have a censoring indicator, which I'll put in the censored field. The quantitative factor of interest is dose. The categorical factors of interest are what clinic it is and whether or not they were in prison. Okay? That's my model. On the next screen, it's going to ask, do I want to fit a first-order model or a second-order model? First-order model will have just main effects. Second-order model will have interactions as well. And there's an exclude button, incidentally, where I could exclude particular terms. I also need to specify, though, when I'm doing this fit, what distribution I want to assume for deviations around the regression line. And the Weibull distribution actually does the best job in this case. So it's gone ahead now, and it's fit that life data regression. Down here, you see the likelihood ratio tests. Dose was highly significant. The clinic they went to was also highly significant. Whether or not they'd gone to prison is marginal. It has a p-value of about 0.06. Okay. Here is, incidentally, the mathematical model that was fit. It's what's called a log linear model. If you take the log of days, it's linearly related to the x variables. And you can see down here the, that it has defined indicator variables for both the clinic and the prison. And finally, uh, the output is shown in terms of percentiles. Here is a plot, days in clinic on the left-hand axis, the y-axis, dose along the bottom. There is a line, three lines actually, one for the median, 
the 50th percentile as a function of dose, one for the 5th percentile, and one for the 95th percentile. Okay. I should also warn you, a lot of this is an extrapolation. They really never gave doses over 80, so a lot of what you see above 80 is an extrapolation. But it does turn out that the higher the dose, the longer people stayed in the clinic. Also, if I switch over and show you prison, I believe that's the interesting one, uh, you can see that there's a slight effect of the prison. If you had been in prison before, it turns out that the expected days in the clinic is a little smaller than if you had not been to prison. Okay, well, those are the different examples I wanted to show you today of doing regression analysis with categorical factors. Uh, I have posted the slides at, uh, let me see if I can find the link, there it is, at www.stackgraphics.com slash webinars. Give us a few uh, hours and we'll also have a recording of the webinar up there as well as the data sets. All right, now if we have some questions, uh, I can answer them. Um, oh, no questions so far. We actually had very good attendance at the webinar. None of you out there had any particular questions? Well, in that case, I guess we will uh, stop the webinar. Again, I will put up the sample data sets. I will put up the, the um, recording of the video as soon as we finish. Uh, if you do have questions that you think of, um, please go ahead, send them to either neil at statpoint.com or support at statgraphics.com and we'll be happy to respond. Uh, one person did respond, they said, we enjoyed the presentation, but we are hungry. <laughs> I guess I am running into lunchtime. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. Um, I'll talk to you again in the not too distant future.